Welcome to Rupa Love Composer and You Can Love It Too. Does it sound well? Yeah. Great. <laughs> Sorry? Is there a mic or? No. I mean, I don't think so. With the red light there is the microphone there. Behind. Yeah, yeah. For the recording, but not for the room. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Kevin Porras, a senior Drupal developer for Evolving Web. I come from Costa Rica. I've been working with Drupal for quite a long time. I love continuous integration, DevOps stuff, and of course, teaching Drupal. Nice to meet you. So Evolving Web is a team of plus than 40 people, designers, developers, strategists, project managers, etc. We've been specializing in Drupal for the last 13 years. And we like to work with organizations that want to make a big impact to the world. These are some of our clients. We've collaborated with many university clients over the years, designing, developing websites, but also uh, helping them to build Drupal expertise. So these are some of them. So what will we cover today? Today we'll uh, start from the very basics, how to create a Composer project, then how to add and update dependencies to that Composer project. We'll take a look at what are the Composer scripts. Also, let's talk a bit about the uh, difference between Composer JSON and Composer log files, and how to handle them. We'll look at some popular Composer plugins, and finally, we'll talk a bit about troubleshooting Composer Complete, how to do that. So, let's start with creating a Composer project. The first thing you need to do when you are starting your project com with Composer is to define what is the template that you are going to use. So there are two main templates in the Drupal community. Of course, you can extend from them and create your own template, but the two main templates are Drupal Composer slash Drupal Project, which was the a community, actually it is a community maintained uh, Drupal template. And there is also the official Drupal slash recommended project. So you can check them out, see what works better for your project. So the first one adds uh, some stuff from country, for example, that's Drudge, while the second one is only Drupal core. So it depends on you actually what you want to do. And once you have choose your project, then you should just run Composer, create project, and then the template that you are going to use in the form vendor slash project. And then wait for Composer to grab all of your dependencies, and you're ready to start working in your new Drupal project. Usually, that means adding and updating dependencies. So how to do that? To add a dependency, it's as easy as running a composer required command. So the package name for this composer required command is compound by the vendor and the package. And optionally, you could also pass a version or a version constraint. So the vendor for every project that is housed in Drupal.org will be Drupal. So for example, if you want to add the devil module, so you should run composer required Drupal slash devil. That will make some changes in the composer.json and the composer.log file. So you should commit both of those files to your project. In your source repository, you should not commit, you should avoid committing your vendor and your country project folders because composer is able to get them. So why are you going to populate your source repository with lots of stuff that composer can actually get for you later? So do not do that if possible. There are also some optional flags that you could pass to that composer required command. So you could pass dash dash no update. With that, you are telling composer, OK, please only update composer.json file and not actually try to resolve the dependencies. I'll do that later for you. I'll, I'll ask you later to do that, actually. But you could also use update with dependencies flag, which are, which, with that, you are instructing composer, OK, when you are getting this package, if there are any package that needs update that is a dependency of this package, go ahead, update it, please. However, Composer will refuse to update dependencies if those dependencies are also listed in your composer.json. 
So for example, let's say you are requiring Drupal slash devil, and Drupal slash devil has some dependency on Drupal slash core, and you do, when you run Composer require Drupal slash devil, update with dependencies, and there is a update for Drupal core, it won't do that because Drupal core is listed as a good dependency in your Composer JSON. So if you actually want to do that, you should use the other flag, update with all dependencies. So that's the difference between those two flags. Another couple of things to keep in mind when you are running Composer required commands is that in your Composer.json there are a couple of flags that are important for the dependency resolution process. One of them is prefer stable. If you use the prefer stable flag in your Composer.json, you are telling Composer, hey, please try first getting a stable versions of the packages. And only if you are not able to find a, a stable version, then go to maybe RC candidates or beta or alpha or whatever else. But first, try to use a stable. Another flag is minimum stability. With that, you are telling Composer, OK, the minimum stability that I want for all of my packages is, let's say, beta, or let's say, stable. So that flag will actually enforce composers to not bring you any package that is less stable than that. So for example, if you set minimum stability to beta, it won't allow you to install dev or alpha packages, because that's less unstable than what you are expecting. So when you are uh, required a composer package, as I said, you could also specify a version or a version constraint. Composer packages are expected to be using semantic version. That is, major, that minor, that bad. Sample, 9.4.1. So a major version expects to bring in new features, plus potentially breaking backwards compatibility. So for example, version 9 for Drupal, version 10 for Drupal. A minor version only provides new features and potentially could provide bug fixes. So for example, Drupal 9.3, 9.4. But a patch version only fixes bugs. So hopefully it won't ever break backwards compatibility. So for example, Drupal 9.3.1, 9.3.2. When you specify a version in a requirement, you could do it either by using the full version or by using version constraints. Those version constraints could be in several ways. So it could be let's say greater than or equal this version or greater than or equal this version and less than this other version but you could also use these special characters the tilde and the constraint characters let's start with the tilde so tilde may mean something differently depending on how you specify the requirement so let's say you use tilde 1.2.3 that means greater than or equal 1.2.3 but less than 1.3.0 but if you only do tilde 1.2 that means everything between 1.2 and 2.0 look at the difference depending on how many items in the version you specify it will mean something different on the other hand if you use caret it will be it will stick more closely to semantic versioning so it doesn't matter if you do caret 1.2.3 or caret 1.2, it will always mean exactly the same. Starting from this version that I'm telling you and less than the next major version. So my recommendation is stick with caret for, a, for almost everything. And if you actually have a need for the tilde character, then go for it. But if not, stick with caret. So next, update dependencies. To update dependencies in Composer, you could do it in either of this way. So you could just instruct Composer, OK, please update all of the dependencies in my project. So to do that, simply Composer update. It will update everything in your project that, it's, that has a pending update. But you could also do Composer update and pass a list of packages that you want to update and it will only update those packages. So let's say you want to only update Drupal slash devil and Drupal slash admin toolbar. So Composer updates those packages and it will only update those packages. 
But there are also these with dependencies and with all dependencies flag that work exactly the same than uh, update with dependencies and update with all dependencies in the compose required. So if you pass with dependencies, it will update this package and its dependencies, but it won't update dependencies that are listed in your root composer.json. If you want also to do that, you should pass with all dependencies. Now let's talk a bit about composer repository. So a repository is a package source. It's actually a list of packages and version. By default, Composer looks for packages in the main packages repository, and these Drupal templates also adds the Drupal packages repository. You could also add your own repositories, and they could be of different types. We'll talk a bit about repository types in the next slides. But uh, in your usual Composer-based Drupal project, you will have at least this repository, the packages repository, which is there by default. You don't actually need to add it anywhere in your Composer JSON. Composer will always look there. And you also have the Drupal packages repository. And you could, if you want, if you need, you could add other repositories there. So how to add repositories? Repositories, as I said, could be of different types. It could be BCS repository, it could be path repository, or it could be even a package repository. There are some other types there. So if it's a BCS repository, you only need to declare the type and the URL for that repository. The URL will usually be a Git URL, but it's not Git specific. It could also be subversion or whatever else BCS is out there yet. If it's a path repository, again, you just declare the path and the URL. And that URL will usually be a relative path to your composer.json file. And it could also be a package type. So if it's a package type, you should declare the package information, like, OK, it's a type package. What's the name of the package? What is the type of the package? What is the version of this package that I'm filing? And you should also declare what is the source, where is Composer going to be able to grab this package into your project. So in this case, the source could be type git, the URL to that git repo, and the reference to check out that reference, of course, could be a branch, a path, or commit has, or whatever. So that's for Composer repositories. Now let's look at Composer script. A script is used to execute package custom code or a specific commands during the composer execution process. They are super useful for things like cleanup, patching scaffold files, running custom code, etc. So a script could be hooked into an event. Composer provides lots of events for all of the different commands that you may run with composer. So some common events are these that are in this slide, so pre and post install CMD, pre and post update CMD, pre and post package CMD. So for the first two ones, pre install and post install CMD, those events will be executed when you run composer install and you already have a composer log file, so composer is not resolving dependencies at all, it's just installing what is there. So that will trigger pre install and post install CMD. If you have to resolve any dependencies, either because you are requiring a new package, because you are running Composer update, then these pre-update and post-update CMD events will be triggered. And if you are installing a new package, that means only Composer required, then it will trigger those two uh, events. So usually if you need to hook into an event, that may be because you need to uh, do something with the package that you are just installing, or with the full project. So usually, we'll uh, focus on the first four events in this slide. So a script is defined like this. So in this example, we are first defining a script that is named Drupal Escafold. And when you run that Drupal Escafold script, it will go and run the Escafold function, which is a static function, in the plugin class that is located in that namespace. And then you could also add that script into an event. So for example, post install CMD. What it will do is that it will call the Drupal scaffold script 
that it's added in the previous line. So a script could be a function in a PHP file, or it could also be some bash scripts, like in this example, also install CMD is doing a bit of cleanup by removing all of the that git and that github folder in the vendor uh, in the vendor folder. So if you need to if you already defined your scripts and you need to run them, so you could run them by composer run, also composer and the other script name should work. But if you are running it, what you want to do is to run all of the scripts that are attached to a given event then should, you should room composer room script and the name of the event. So for example, composer room script post install cmd that will room all of the composer scripts that are attached to the post install cmd event. So that is for composer scripts. Now let's talk a bit about composer JSON and composer log files. So these files are in charge of maintaining your composer project, the dependencies of your, of your composer project. So composer JSON shows what have you requested for your project, while composer log shows what composer result for your project. So let's say you requested Drupal carrot 9.3 and then uh, composer result Drupal 9.3.8. So that's why composer JSON may use constraints, while composer log will always use exact package version. So both of these files should be always committed to your repository so that composer knows later how to recreate your code base. So that way, when you are running composer install, composer install will only look at your composer.log file while composer updates will create update that file, that composer.log file. If you run composer install and there is no composer log file present on your project, then that composer install is equivalent to running composer update. So that means composer will try to resolve all of the dependencies. And please, 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 never delete any of those files. Never delete composer JSON or composer log file. Even if you are having a big com composer conflict, composer issue, deleting composer.log is usually not the right way to fix it. And we'll talk about that a bit later. So now let's talk a bit about some popular composer plugins, especially for Drupal projects, of course. Before doing that, uh, short notice, since composer 2.2, there is a new uh, configuration element in composer.json file, which is allow plugins. That configuration element is like an allow list for your plugin, so that instructs composer, okay, these plugins are allowed to run when I run composer commands. <coughs> so that's included in composer 2.2. That's sort of optional right now, so if you are running composer install and it doesn't have that setting, then it will prompt you to add your plugins to that. But starting in July, that will be mandatory. And if a plugin is not a allowed list, then it won't run at all. So keep that in mind, please. So Composer Installers. This is a plugin that allows you to install packages to the right location, depending on the package type. So for example, if you are in a Drupal project, a Drupal module, you don't want to be installed in the vendor folder, you want it to be installed in web modules country, so you could do that with Composer Installer, and that's configured by default in the templates that I mentioned before. So packages location is configurable, packages could be also individually added to a specific location, so let's say you have a specific need so that this package goes to this specific location, you can do that. But this Composer Installer will only work for previously defined by the package maintainers, previously defined package types. So no arbitrary package types are allowed here in this project. And that's for security. Uh, there is a issue in GitHub that discusses that. So if you need to allow arbitrary package types, then you need this other plugin that is in this slide, Composer Installer Extenders. 
This plugin, of course, extends Composer Installer to support arbitrary package types. So if you need to do that, you need to define two settings in your Composer JSON. One is extra installer types, and then, of course, where are you installing that? So uh, a common use case for this is if you are using the asset packages repository and you are installing NPM assets, so that's not a package type defined in Composer Installer, so you define it using Composer Installer Extender, and then you point those assets to a uh, web libraries folder. Another really important plugin in Drupal is Core Composer Scaffold. This plugin replaces the old Drupal Composer slash Drupal Scaffold that was also community maintained in the times before Drupal actually adopted Composer. It allows you to scaffold files from the dependencies to the, to the correct file location. So both uh, templates are really include the basic configuration for this plugin, but let's look at some of those configuration items. So first thing you need to do is to allow what are the packages that are allowed to scaffold in this project. So let's say allow uh, Drupal score to scaffold, or let's allow my great project to scaffold files. Also, you need to define the web root location. So use, use that extra Drupal scaffold locations and then the name of the location, in this case, web root. And also, of course, you need to define what are the files that you are actually allowing to scaffold or what are the files that you are forbidding to scaffold. So there are lots of configuration for that under the file mapping configuration key. So my recommendation, because lots and lots of configuration options is go and check out the docs. It's really, really powerful, this plugin. Of course, if we are talking about Drupal, we should talk about patches. So how to do patching with Composer? Using Composer Patches plugin. So this plugin enables Composer to patch your project dependencies. It will actually patch the package the next time you run a composer install command. So remember that I said the composer install only looks at composer.log file? Yeah, that's kind of true for this plugin. This plugin will actually look, look at your composer.json file. Basic usage, extra, patches, then the package name, let's say Drupal last core, and then one line per, package, per patch. So at the left, it's a comment, it's just text, suggestion, patch description, or maybe Drupal.org URL or whatever. And to the right, the patch URL. That could be a URL in the internet, or that could be a URL in your local folder. Some extra options, some extra configuration options for this plugin, exit on fail. So by default, if a patch fails to apply, then it will just move on and continue with the next one. But sometimes this is not a desired behavior. I actually say most of the time this is not a desired behavior because if you are adding a patch, it's because you need that patch functionality. So if it fails, then maybe you want to get notified about that. So you could use exit on fail option to tell, hey, Composer, if a patch fails applying, please stop everything and let me know that it fails so that I can go and check out what's going on. What's going on. Also, there is a setting to allow patches that are coming from dependencies. Let's say you are adding a package, and that package has list some patches for Drupal core, for example, or for another project. Then you should enable that explicitly. By default, Composer patches will only add patches from your root Composer JSON file. But if you need to also support adding patches from dependencies, you could do that. Also. Let's say you have a very complex project with lots and lots of patches and you want to move all of those patches to a separate file, then you could do that uh, using a configuration option which is named patch file, I'm not wrong, and you could move all of your patches there so that they are not in your main composer JSON but on a separate file. And if you are allowing patches from dependencies, you could also say, okay, yeah, I'm allowing patches from dependencies, but from this dependency, I, don't, I actually don't want this patch. So you could ignore some patches there. 
Those are options that are there in the module. A bit of troubleshooting with these uh, plugins. If you are just adding a, if you are just adding a new patch and it doesn't seem to be doing anything, then I'd say the first attempt to troubleshoot that would be, okay, go ahead, delete that package. If it's a module, go and actually delete the folder and then rerun Composer install to see if the next time that it runs, it will grab the package and patch it. Then if the error that you are having is that the patch is not applying correctly, then go ahead, type you manually apply that patch to see if, uh, to see how it's run and Maybe you need to reroll that patch, load it again to Drupal.org. Yeah, you should do that. Also, this plugin uses the patch utility on your operating system, so make sure that patch utility is installed. I think it's probably installed on every computer we use nowadays, but make sure it's there. And another interesting item to troubleshoot. Are, are you trying to patch your composer.json file? So let's go back to the Drupal 9 launch times and uh, you were in trying to patch a uh, Drupal 8 only module so that you are able to install it in Drupal 9 and then you are going to patch the things that you need to patch in order to make it Drupal 9 compatible. If what you are trying to do is to patch that composer.json file in order to allow that package to be installed in your project, then you are probably running into a chicken and egg problem. Because in order for a package to be patched, it needs to be able to be installed. Of course, in order for a package to be installed, it should be able to, uh, it should be compatible with whatever you have in your project. So if you are trying to patch your composer.json file, to allow that package to be installed into your project, then probably that's not the right way to do it. So probably you need to go and declare that package as a package repository, and then Composer will skip the dependency resolution for that, and then you will be able to patch whatever you need to patch into that project. Also, of course, we now have the Lenian Composer. If that was your uh, use case, then you could just go ahead and add the Lenian Composer that the Drupal, um, provides, and that will allow you to install D8 only modules in Drupal 9, for example. Uh, small note about patching from Drupal.org. So historically, uh, if you are contributing to a Drupal issue, you, the only way that you had was by uploading a patch file. So when you upload a patch file, you get that patch file URL and you could easily go and put that into your patches configuration. Recently, let's say maybe two years ago, Drupal has been adopting GitLab. So now for some issues, there are merge requests. So if you need to add a patch from an issue and that issue to what it has is a merge request, then uh, of course you could go ahead and put that patch in the merge request URL and that will give you a patch and you could maybe use that URL into your project. But my recommendation is to actually go and download the patch, put it into your project folder and reference it from there. And why is that? Because a merge request is open to the public, anyone could change that merge request and you may be injecting some code that you actually don't know that you are injecting into your project. So. If it's a merge request, my recommendation is go, download it, download the patch, and add it to your project, not link directly to it. So now let's talk a bit about troubleshooting Composer. Let's start by dealing with merge conflicts in composer.log file. So let's say, uh, Different people have been working on different branches, running different composer operations that modify similar sections of your composer.log file. And then you are about to merge your branch to the main branch of your project, so you git pull the main branch into your branch, or you are rebasing your branch, and then you have merge conflicts in composer.log file. If you open that file, it's probably more than 5K lines, 
and it's usually really, really complicated to try to manually resolve the, uh, our merge conflict on those files. So for purpose of this presentation, let's say that we have two different conflict types, one on the hash and one everything else. And we'll talk about those uh, types of conflicts and how to resolve them in the next slide. So before doing that, what not to do when you are dealing with composer.log file uh, merge conflicts. Do not, never, please, delete composer.log and recreate. And that's very tempting to do when you are just starting with composer. Uh, I got this merge conflict with composer.log. Easy peasy. Delete the file, composer update, recreate it again. But what happens when you do that? It will actually resolve all of your dependencies and it will, it will probably update lots and lots of packages that you have not tested yet, so that may break your project. Do not do that, please. Another uh, tempting solution, okay, keep my version of the file, and then just uh, screw up whatever anyone else did. That's another not good way to resolve that. And another not good way to resolve that is try fixing conflicts manually, because it's a really long file, it's a really complex file, so I, most of the time, I don't recommend you to try fixing those conflicts manually. Look, there is a star, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. So, if it's a hash conflict, so composer has, composer.log file has a hash uh, property, so that hash property gets calculated by uh, running an MD5 function into several of the composer.json file uh, sections. So, if your conflict is only on that hash, then yeah, go ahead. Uh, delete the merge conflict markers, keep one of those hashes, no matter what, keep one of them, and then run a composer command to update the hash to the right hash for your current situation. So composer update dash dash clock, and that will recreate that hash for you. So you clean up the conflict, and you, run, uh, you ask composer to recreate that hash. And that's all, you fix your conflict. But if you are having conflicts of anywhere else in your composer.log files, then my recommendation to fix those conflicts is keep the upstream changes, keep the upstream version, and then replay your changes over there. Because after all, it's your branch, so you know what did you do there. So it's easier for you to know what have you been doing on that branch than to know what lots of other people have been doing on the main branch. So git checkout, origin, the base branch, or the upstream branch, composer log and composer JSON, and then replace your changes on top of that. So let's say you were adding devil module, you were updating admin toolbar module, so execute those commands again, composer required, Drupal slash devil, composer update, Drupal slash admin toolbar, and then commit the new changes to the composer JSON and composer log files. And that's all. You fix composer log merge conflicts. It's a bit terrifying at the beginning, but when you start doing that, you get used to that. Also, other common composer problems, dealing with dependency resolution problems. Okay, I want composer to do something, and composer refuses to do that because it's not able to resolve dependency, so it will just bail out with a this long message. And so you start wondering, composer, why? Why are you not doing that? Uh, actually, composer, why? It's a command that you could use in this troubleshooting process. So, composer, why? And a package, and maybe a version will tell you, okay, why is this package in my project? So maybe as part of that long uh, error message that composer throw at you, you found a package that you are not sure how it got to your project. So composer, why? and then it will tell you, okay, this package is installed because this package that is required by this package requires the package that you are asking me. So, okay, that's useful. But also you could run composer, why not? So, composer, why are you refusing to do this? And then composer will tell you, okay, I can install this package in this version because this package is required on this other version by this other package. So, deal with it, fix it yourself. 
Another thing to uh, look when you are resolving this type of conflict is minimum stability. So going back to the example that I said at the beginning, if you are setting minimum stability, let's say stable, and you need to require a module that is not stable, that only has a beta version, then Composer will totally refuse to do that. So you need to go back to your Composer JSON and change your minimum stability to something at least the same than the package that you are requiring and then that will allow you to install that package. Also, if you are requiring or you are updating packages, then the update with dependencies or corresponding with dependencies flag and update with all dependencies or of course the corresponding with all dependencies flag will help you to uh, fix that issue. So real quick, I'm going to see if I can. So this is how a composer not being able to resolve dependencies ever looks like. So as you can see, it's really huge. And there are several lines that say conclusion. Conclusion, don't install this on this version because there is a conflict with something. Uh, also here, there was another error initially. So this is also something useful to look at. Composer plugin API, that means Composer 1 versus Composer 2. Maybe you have packages that requires one or the other one. So take a look to that. And here at the end, conclusion, don't install Symfony bar dumper. And it's saying drush slash drush 10.0.0 requires this version. And you can only install either this or this other version. So you start looking at that and you will find what are your problems. So in this case, uh, let me see where it is. Um, so in this case, the problem was that this person had Drush 10.0.0 explicitly that version in the composer.json file. So uh, when, what, when they were running composer update to upgrade from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9, that version of Drush was too old and was requiring a really old version of bar dumper, so that's why they were having that problem with bar dumper. So possible resolution for this, first, require a newer version of Drush, maybe Composer required Drush uh, slash Drush carrot 10.0, so that it gets the latest one that it's able to get on Drush 10, and after that, run Composer update, maybe with all dependencies, so that it updates everything that it needs to update. And that's probably the way to resolve this specific uh, composer conflict issue. Let me go back. So, questions about composer, about anything we've talked today? Maybe it was a lot, but it's interesting composer stuff. Did you, did you delete composer that live? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Actually, initially, I didn't even commit it to the repo. That was so bad. <laughs> okay, so if no questions. So if you want to learn more about Drupal, at uh, Developing Web, we have a very well-structured uh, training program. These are the upcoming courses, Advanced Drupal Teaming, Drupal Web Accessibility, Atomic and Molecular Design, and also new tracks will be starting on September. Uh, so the full package is compound by 12 different training courses, so feel free to check it out. Let's keep in touch social media, and thank you.